this is the weirdest crime story of a man who was tragically framed, and the more he tried to cover up the crime, the harder it became to escape a life sentence. Sometimes, bad things happen to good people, and such luck was etched into the tragic fate of Ray Ortega, a fate triggered by a crime that changed his life forever. Desperation can turn a pure man wicked, and when Ray's freedom was threatened, he had to cross the line between good and evil to protect his innocence. But sometimes, salvation comes at too high a price. Ray was a loner living in Manhattan, scraping by physically, mentally, and emotionally. He woke up on the floor, dazed and confused, after fainting for the third time that month from yet another chronic migraine caused by stress and anxiety. He was lucky to narrowly avoid blunt force to the head. Something was wrong with his brain, but he ignored it for the moment to prevent fainting again. He rummaged through his memories, trying to recall the misfortune that birthed the stress and anxiety. Then the sight of opened letters on his table triggered a familiar repulsive tremor, a harsh reminder that his store was losing money and he was behind on bills. He collected himself before familiar thoughts of financial ruin and his dwindling enthusiasm for life began to simmer. If he didn't get his life under control, his next faint spell might be his last. A jolt surged through his body as he realized he was late for work, he medicated with a glass of whiskey and mustered up enough willpower to rush to his failing store. He was on the brink of losing everything, but something sinister would soon test his will to either fight for his life or forfeit it. After a dreadful 10-hour shift of making little to no money, it was time to close. Soon his store would close for good, and with life worsening by the day, he saw no point in saving it. Why try, he thought, if he was destined to fail? Suddenly his landlord rushed into the store. A sketchy man in a hoodie barged in seconds later. The landlord, who always saw Ray as a son, hightailed it toward him. The hooded man slowly wove through the aisles, watching the landlord like a hawk hunting its prey. The overhead light flickered onto her, revealing the fear in her eyes and trembling that plagued her body. Ray made eye contact with the hooded man at the other end of the store. Without provoking the man to react, Ray nervously shifted his glance back to the landlord. Whispering, she told Ray that the hooded man had been following her and sensed in her brittle bones insidious intentions. She had been praying to make it here so Ray could create a window for her to escape. Her cry for help was Ray's worst nightmare since his wobbly knees had never let him stand his ground in the face of conflict. The hooded man paced back and forth, marking his territory. Despite fearing the landlord's escape, he was hesitant to strike since Ray was in his way. Ray sensed an incoming faint spell. He doubted he could suppress his stress and anxiety long enough for her to escape, but for her sake, he was willing to try. Ray disarmed the doorbell that rang when people entered and exited and slowly treaded toward the man. His face was dirty, with a menacing scar intersecting a blind eye while the other was bloodshot and soulless. The moment Ray stood in the man's blind spot to block his line of vision, she quietly escaped. Angered by Ray's distraction, the hooded man began trashing the store. Ray was powerless as he watched the rampage. Suddenly, the hooded man charged at Ray to make him pay for meddling with his target. Paralyzed, with his back against a freezer, a migraine surfaced from Ray's stress and anxiety as he awaited the wrath of a raging bull. But at the last second, the hooded man looked up at a camera on the wall that pointed directly at him. With his identity compromised, he left the store. Relief calmed Ray and he narrowly avoided a faint spell, but was it luck or a segue to something worse? It was late and Ray walked home from work, alert and cautious as always. He was never able to ignore the uneasy anticipation of something bad happening, as danger could spawn at any moment in this city at this hour. He looked to his left, then his right, to make sure the coast was clear. He scanned over his shoulder, only to find a deserted sidewalk. But when he turned back around, a shadow appeared and tossed him into a nearby alley. 
The alley swallowed them like a black hole. The pungent scent of garbage made it hard to breathe. Ray crouched against a wall as the shadow inched closer to him. To his dismay, it was the same hooded man from the store. He had meddled with his prey, and the man said he wanted revenge as no good deed went unpunished. Ray stammered while he apologized, saying anything under the sun to get off scot-free. But his pleas fell on deaf ears. The hooded man had come to collect what he felt was owed to him. The alley altercation went unnoticed as a cop car lazily passed by, taking any hope of Ray's escape with it, but leaving the hooded man with urgency to act before getting caught. Ray anxiously surrendered to his fate, causing the migraine that had been brewing since the store to bear its fangs. He fainted, fell, and hit his head on the ground. While he was unconscious, the hooded man stole his wallet and fled. But when Ray woke up, he would be far from the alley, stuck between this world and the next. The deafening chop of a helicopter woke Ray up in a cold sweat. It shined a blinding white light into his room, illuminating an unexplainable mess and clutter. Memories of the alley altercation flooded his mind, but he didn't remember how he got home. He was wearing a completely different set of clothes too. Suddenly, someone banged aggressively on his front door. Ray opened the door and was relieved to see his landlord, who had safely made it home. Strangely, his warmth was greeted with attitude as she reprimanded him about not paying rent since his store went out of business six months ago. She rudely dismissed his claim of her recently being at the store, declaring that she had never lowered herself to step foot in there and wouldn't dare to now if it were still open. She warned him that if the commotion from earlier in the night continued, she would call the cops since it was past the nationwide curfew. She demanded to receive the rent payment soon and stormed off, leaving Ray puzzled. Commotion? What commotion? Why had she changed from heartwarming to heartless? How was the store suddenly out of business? Was there really a nationwide curfew? Nothing made sense and he took a deep, nervous breath as his frustration bubbled. Ray turned on the news for answers and was startled. Muffled police sirens fought their way through the window curtains. The anchor reported that despite crime being at an all-time low since the United States became a police state a year ago, hostility was on the rise as it became harder for people to survive under this new iron fist. He then reported an altercation caught on camera a few hours earlier, where a man wearing a black hat escorted a man he had injured to a Toyota from the same alley where Ray had fainted. The anchor claimed that before the altercation, the unidentified man wearing the black hat was seen coming from an abandoned version of Ray's store. Ray's stomach turned as he noticed a black hat on a nearby coffee table. He wobbled over to it and discovered Toyota car keys next to the hat. A picture of the familiar man appeared on the TV screen, and to Ray's surprise it was the same hooded man that had destroyed his store. Despite the police failing to identify the culprit in the black hat, Ray could. By looking down at his own body, he realized that he was wearing the same clothes as the culprit. Ray drowned out news of an ongoing search for both men as he struggled to grasp the fact that he was wanted for a crime he didn't remember committing in an unfamiliar world. He rushed to the window for air to calm his growing agitation. He opened the curtains and finally saw the police state in full force with helicopters, police cars and policemen patrolling the dark, soulless city. The startling sight triggered his stress, induced a migraine and caused him to faint. Ray woke up to the sound of the soft patter of water hitting a surface. Thick steam blocked his already blurred vision. He stumbled to his feet, fighting through his imbalanced equilibrium while adjusting to the heat with heaving breaths. The back of his head that had absorbed the impact of the faint spell in the alley throbbed with unbearable pain. But he was relieved, as this was a sign he was back in his own body, in his familiar reality. He looked at the foggy bathroom mirror and saw a cryptic message that read, Where am I? His heart skipped a beat. He frantically searched his apartment, looking for the culprit who had written that message. After searching everywhere, he collapsed to the floor, gripped his face tightly, and screamed to alleviate his feeling of insanity. Was it all a dream? Had he imagined it all? Was he going crazy? 
turbulent thoughts invaded his mind. He charged to the window, pulled the curtains open, and pressed himself against the fragile glass. The sight of the city, ordinary and absent of heavy policing, reassured him that he had returned to his own reality. But the question still remained, who had written the cryptic message? The next morning, after filing a police report for the mugging, he visited the doctor, got diagnosed with a concussion, and was prescribed medicine. For three days, he prevented migraines and fainting by religiously taking the medicine every morning before work. But despite this good habit, bad ones still remained. After a long night of medicating himself with whiskey, he woke up late with nothing on his mind except getting dressed and hurrying to work. At work, the bank called him to confirm that the money in his checking account had been stolen by the mugger. His account wouldn't be replenished for several weeks, leaving him penniless. After hours of no business, he felt a migraine brewing and remembered that he had rushed to work without taking his medicine. He immediately closed his store and rushed home before he fainted. This headache and stress intensified with every step he took. He arrived at his front door but dropped his keys. As he bent down, a sting in his temples almost took him out. He managed to get into his apartment, but as he opened the pill bottle, another sting in his temples sucked out the strength from his body. He collapsed to the ground and drifted off into the nightmare realm. Ray woke up near a garbage bag in different clothes, in the same yet different apartment again. He looked inside the bag and saw the mugger's ID, along with the same clothes the mugger had worn. In this world, he was at the center of a crime, so he quickly closed the bag and headed for the front door to dispose of the incriminating evidence. He stopped short when he heard knocks on the door. Looking through the peephole, he saw two police officers. Scared to death, he clutched the bag and opened the door. The two police officers barged in and cornered him. They asked him about his whereabouts during the crime, as the unidentified criminal had been seen coming from an abandoned store once owned by Ray. He stuttered through his alibi, which forced one officer to order the other to search the apartment for evidence. Ray's feeble demand for a warrant was spat at as the officer rampaged through the apartment. The other officer warned that every crime now led to a life sentence, and if he was hiding something, they would find it. He stared into Ray's wounded soul, silently making it known that he was a suspect until the other officer appeared empty-handed. They marched toward the front door to exit, and Ray breathed a sigh of relief, but suddenly they demanded to look inside the garbage bag. Ray said it was just garbage, but the officer snatched it, sniffed it, and in a wicked tone said that it didn't smell rotten. He motioned to untie the bag, but by the grace of God, a dispatch call ordered the officers to report to an emergency. As they rushed out of the apartment, the landlord eavesdropped through her peephole. Ray locked the door and threw the garbage bag onto what appeared to be a sofa, displacing the cushions and the draped cover, revealing a large black chest. Curiosity overrode his anguish, and the mysterious chest pulled him in like gravity. He unbuckled it. A putrid smell contorted his face, and what he saw caused him to faint. Upon waking up in his normal apartment, Ray searched for the medicine. He raided his cabinets one after another, searching for the saving grace that couldn't be found. He then remembered dropping them when he recently fainted, so he scanned the floor, but to no avail. The medicine was missing. While looking, he stumbled upon a letter on a table that he hadn't written, but was in his handwriting. The letter started with a man introducing himself as Ray from a parallel reality, who uncontrollably shifted into this reality and inherited Ray's body. He had seen the medicine bottle with Ray's name and realized that they were the same person, inhabiting each other's bodies during the shift. He didn't know how or why he shifted until he saw that the medicine was for a concussion. Before shifting, he felt a sharp migraine and fainted, which was odd as he never suffered from migraines, thus realizing that Ray's concussion caused the shift. He explained the crime, saying that he had defended himself when the mugger attempted to rob him. Unfortunately, he got carried away and now the police were after him. He mentioned his plan to take the black chest Ray had seen to his Toyota and dispose of it and the car to destroy evidence. He then issued a warning. If Ray doesn't help him, he won't give back the medicine. And if the police charged him for the crime and the shifting didn't stop, 
Ray could end up serving the jail sentence as well, so Ray must help cover up the crime before it was too late. Ray crumpled up the paper. Fear and anxiety kicked in. He called the doctor's office for a new prescription, but they couldn't prescribe more since the doctor was on vacation. To preserve his life and freedom, covering up a crime he didn't commit may have been his only choice. Ray wrote a letter back to his parallel self, demanding to know if he had hidden the medicine. He mentioned the police search and refused to help cover up the crime. Not his life, not his problem, so he wanted to be left out of it. The next day at work, he impatiently waited for a faint spell. Toward the end of his shift, his wish was granted, and he woke up to the sound of a blaring car horn. He lifted his head from the Toyota's steering wheel and saw he was in an abandoned industrial area. The city-wide curfew would begin in 10 minutes, and he was in a car that was part of an ongoing criminal investigation. He motioned to abandon the car and run until he saw gasoline and lighter fluid in the passenger seat next to a note with escape route instructions. Remembering that his parallel self had planned to destroy evidence, he became conflicted. Should he refuse to be an accomplice to the crime, or should he destroy the evidence to avoid potentially sharing jail time? The fear of jail overshadowed his morals. With his life and freedom at stake, he agreed to destroy the Toyota and the black chest within it. The flames emerged from the burning car, illuminating the dark surroundings. Thick smoke rose high and blended into the night sky. A helicopter's rumble broke through the crackling of the flames, and suddenly a searchlight shone on the burning car and Ray. He was now in the clutches of the police and had to escape immediately. Caught in the belly of the beast, he scanned the escape route on the piece of paper and ran toward a park full of trees for coverage. The searchlight shot down through the scant openings between the trees, like a pillar of light chasing Ray. Police sirens blended with a heavier siren, signaling the beginning of curfew. As police cars sped down every street, Ray pivoted into an abandoned warehouse. Officers chased him as he ran from one warehouse to another. He finally ducked behind a stack of crates, and the officers quietly floated through the shadows. An officer searched around the crates and narrowly missed Ray, who was holding his breath under a veil of darkness. Unable to detect him, they deployed a drone. It soared through the air and quickly spotted him hidden in the shadows, so he hightailed it before his identity was compromised. Weaving through the hallways, Ray saw a piece of broken equipment in his path. He picked it up and chucked it at the drone, destroying it. He stumbled onto the street and scaled the side of cars to get further away from the police. After a few blocks, he reviewed the escape route and entered an alley. Once he arrived at the other end of the alley, he peered around the corner and saw that the subway station he was supposed to escape in was blocked by a police checkpoint. The route showed another subway station to use, but he had to cross the street undetected and run down another alley before entering it. The helicopter's searchlight appeared at the opposite end of the alley that Ray was in and slowly inched toward his direction. With only seconds before the light spotted him, he perfectly timed his sprint across the street and avoided detection. Despite reaching the other alley, the searchlight continued heading his way. Gasping, he mustered up his last bit of strength to run through the alley as the pillar of light trailed closely behind him. Right as the light was about to graze him, he jumped down the subway staircase. The searchlight shone over the empty subway entrance, then moved on elsewhere. The trains weren't operating during curfew, so he walked down the tracks, following the route back to the apartment. Exhausted and defeated, Ray dragged his feet toward the apartment. The adrenaline kept him from fainting. He passed the landlord's door and noticed it was slightly open. Even with no more energy to give, he worried for her. After all, no one's door should have been left unlocked in this hostile world. He tried to convince himself not to get involved, but his soft spot for her in his reality swayed him to make sure she was okay. He opened the door and called out her name, but didn't get a response. Low music came from a dimly lit area on the other side of the apartment. He glided toward the sound, being careful not to startle her if she saw him. She already despised him in this reality, and he didn't want to give her a reason to act on it. He could barely see his surroundings, as if he was walking into a black hole toward a ball of light. 
He walked into the light and entered the kitchen. The music drowned out his scream. He stumbled back into a wall, his eyes stained with his worst nightmare. He escaped and ran to his alternate self's apartment. The stress and shock from both the police chase and the landlord's apartment compounded into the worst migraine he had ever felt. He wrote a note to his alternate self, telling him about the two instances before fainting and shifting back to his reality. Once he was back, he turned his kitchen upside down to find the medicine. The migraine was more intense than usual and ended up lingering, shoving him back to the parallel reality. Ray saw the alternate's response to his note, which revealed that he was responsible for what transpired in the landlord's apartment. She had eavesdropped on the police's apartment search, and once she saw him lug the mysterious black chest out of his apartment, she threatened to report his suspicious activity to the police. Ray's anger boiled, and before his migraine took over and shifted him back to his reality, he wrote that he'd snitch. Ray woke up and continued to search for his medicine until he shifted again. In the alternate's response, he begged Ray not to snitch after all, it would jeopardize his life and freedom as well. Fishing for sympathy, he explained how hard life had been since the police state began and losing his store. He claimed he knew the only person who could understand his troubles and help him was himself and thanked Ray for easing his loneliness. Normally, Ray would disregard this sob story, but since it was coming from himself, it pulled on his heartstrings. He had hidden the medicine because he couldn't get through this alone and begged Ray to help him one last time with the landlord situation. To win Ray's trust and help, he even revealed where he had hidden the medicine. With only seconds to decide before he shifted, Ray promised that he'd help and wrote, Tomorrow this ends. Prepare another chest and I'll take care of the rest. Don't move the medicine from the cabinet above the sink. Back in his reality, Ray found the medicine and consumed it to stop the rapid shifting. With the medicine in his possession, he felt in control for the first time, but questioned whether he should break his promise or not. His uncertainty shifted to uneasiness. He wondered if it was the right move to give the sympathy and empathy he had always wished for to his alternate self. But even if they shared the same identity, were they the same person? Could he be trusted? What if the shifting stopped while he was in the parallel reality and he got stuck there forever? He had always wanted someone to help him with his troubles and now he could be that savior to himself. Since the alternate returned the medicine and was trusting him, Ray believed that he could trust him in return. He decided to hide the new chest in the abandoned store his alternate self had once owned. The next day arrived and Ray shifted into the parallel reality after he purposely didn't take the medicine. He heard the usual helicopters and police sirens echoing through the shackled city. He walked around the apartment, oddly admiring how similar it looked to his, and saw the new black chest with a note that said, thanks for everything. He smiled, even though he knew he shouldn't. He prepared to take the chest to the store, but heard a knock on the front door. When he opened it, the two police officers from before barged in. Once again, they cornered him for interrogation. They had retrieved the burning Toyota and wanted to know about his whereabouts during the night of the police chase. His mind went blank. He hadn't foreseen the police showing up, so he had never prepared an alibi. Remembering that they searched without a warrant, it was only a matter of time before they discovered the black chest. His body tensed up and began to sweat, as if he was flying too close to the sun. They invaded his personal space and yelled, but all he heard was a ringing inside his head that signaled an incoming migraine. Although this time he welcomed it, as it was his escape from this dead-end dilemma. As he plummeted to the floor, he felt content knowing that he had tried to help. To his dismay, he woke up to the police shaking him, but he was relieved to see only one of the officers and not both. A good sign that he had shifted into his reality. But if he had shifted, he wondered why police would be in this apartment too. While the officer helped him up, he remembered that he had filed a police report about the mugging, so they must be here for that. Ray darted for the cabinet above the sink and opened it to see the medicine inside. Happy that he had escaped to his reality, he consumed it. For a final confirmation, 
he asked the officer if they were discussing the mugging, and he proceeded to say yes. But then a voice from another room called out for the officer. The officer tended to the call and Ray followed him. Horrified, the two stared at the opened black chest. Ray looked inside the medicine bottle and saw pills inscribed with the word Tylenol. He came to a shocking revelation. His alternate had never planned to shift back. The sob story was a lie to manipulate Ray. His alternate had planted fake medicine, ready to deceive Ray into believing he had returned to his original reality. And it worked. Meanwhile, the alternate took the real medicine, halting his own shift. As Ray reread the note, the true weight of the words, thank you for everything, hit him. His life had been stolen, and his alternate was finally free, 